Welcome to Northwell's Health Raise Health Forum. I'm Dr. Jennifer Morales, Professor of Cardiology, and I've had the honor and privilege of being the inaugural Chief Diversity and Inclusion Officer at Northwell Health. I am joined today by a distinguished and luminary pal panel. We have um, joining us today, Marcus Osborne, SVP of Walmart Health, joined by Megan Callahan, President of Healthcare at Lyft, and a 2020 Women of Influence uh, awardee, as well as joined by the luminary, Dr. Reverend Malcolm Bird, Pastor and Chief of Protocol at the Mother AME Zion Church. And I would say, welcome you all. Dr. Bird is a friend of Northwell. Dr. Bird delivered our MLK, Martin Luther King keynote address this year and has been a true partner with Northwell Health. So welcome everyone. And I, and I think it's important. We're at a landmark moment in time. This is a time for redesign, rebooting, resetting. And I look to the three of you to give us some insights as to what you've done. And I will talk about this in the context, as, as a cardiologist, we always look for themes and acronyms. And I think in thinking of today's conversation, where we're focusing on community partnerships and the path forward for equitable healthcare, uh, themes that come to mind or words that come to mind, one, raise health, which is Northwell's platform, partnerships, and it's public, private, faith-based partnership, trust is important, access is a key word, and transportation for us all to be on the journey to healthy living. And I want to start, I'll take two, one, 30 seconds to start with a poem that I think will resonate with all of us today um, from our US Youth Poet Laureate 2020, Amanda Gorman. And we saw her brilliance at the inaug presidential inauguration. Her poem, The Miracle of Morning, um, the first few lines are, from a wave of woes, a world will emerge stronger. We'll observe how the burdens braved by humankind are also the moments that make us humans kind. Let every dawn find us courageous and brought closer. So I'm going to turn to Dr. Bird, Reverend Malcolm Bird, to tell us COVID-19 unmasked the health inequities. We saw in your communities in Harlem, you know, that vulnerable communities, black and brown communities, definitely hit the hardest. Tell us a little bit about what happened um, in your community and some insights to, to, to take us on the path forward. Thank you so very much, Jennifer. And indeed, I am thrilled to be here on this morning. What we saw here in Harlem, as well as in other uh, black and brown marginalized communities at the start of the COVID-19 pandemic was the pot beginning to boil over. We have long known that this pot of uh, health inequities have been simmering um, long and bitterly in our community. We have been treated in many respects as, as lab animals, where in marginalized communities, uh, the only access to health we really had was to be a part of the latest study uh, that some medical researcher or some teaching hospital uh, was conducting but there really wasn't an interest in providing necessary services to assist marginalized black and brown people as those of us here in central Harlem to be on a full path towards health and wholeness. That did not exist. And so what we have seen is that these disparities in health exceed beyond our communities being food desert. It also goes to uh, what is the quality of education provided in those communities? Uh, what uh, is the quality of life like in those communities? Uh, until a few years ago here in central Harlem, uh, when there was an effort to plant trees along uh, the streets here in central Harlem, a study proved that it was much cooler on the Upper East Side than it was in Central Harlem simply because there were no trees in Central Harlem. What we have discovered is that healthcare entities, I, if I could plug Northwell Health, 
have been very interested in building what Dr. King called beloved community, where we just don't want to put a Band-Aid on the issue. We want to address as a community, stakeholders in the community and large healthcare groups to address the systemic issues that have brought these health disparities to the table. Thank you. Well said. And, you know, resonating with, you know, health is your most important asset. The humanism reigniting the human connection truly, truly of paramount importance right now. So I'd like to turn to, to Megan uh, Callahan. Megan, could you tell us a little bit? We know transportation is among the most common barriers to care. And you and your team at Lyft came to life and spearheaded an effort to really provide you know, transportation access to testing for COVID-19 and now to vaccinations. Tell us a little bit about your, your thinking and the foundation of, of this. Sure, and thanks, Jennifer. Great intro and Malcolm, um, everything you said really resonated and um, didn't love to hear it, but um, I love the way you framed up the, the issue. Um, so at Lyft, um, Jennifer, you're absolutely right. 5.8 million uh, Americans can't get to medical appointments every year because they physically can't get to those appointments. Um, even outside of Lyft's healthcare uh, segment, we have 30% um, of Lyft riders, consumer riders, using Lyft to go to medical appointments every year, and 40% of our rides overall either start or end in areas of low socioeconomic um, uh, status. So uh, transportation is a key, key barrier, and really, I believe, you know, an arbiter to overall, overall health. So when, when COVID hit, obviously, we were inundated. Um, with organizations that needed help getting patients to and from their appointments. Many of them were health systems. Of course, no one had budgeted for anything. And we were really focused on getting um, people who were did not have access to a car, did not have a driver's license, did not have access to public transport. Because as you may remember, a lot of the public transport um, routes had been either greatly reduced or shut down during COVID. So for some people, that was a more or, or more typical avenue to get to healthcare facilities or to mass vaccination sites, and they just weren't they weren't available to them anymore. So we very quickly um, mobilized, realizing the scale of the problem, realizing the the unique role that Lyft could play in that. And Jennifer, in the beginning, you brought up you brought up partnership, right? So we immediately started calling some of our largest partners and asking them um, for donations into our vaccine access program. And I have to say the, the response from um, corporate, corporate America and, and, and partners of Lyft, I felt to be completely overwhelming in their, their need to really do something to help um, and, and, and pitch in. So we worked with you know Delta, Anthem, Santine, Kroger. Um, we established over 150 partnerships um, where we had donations and then we worked with the United Way, who in turn was working with many faith-based organizations to reach out into the community um, with CVS in particular to get people in um, to these vaccine sites. So we've received a lot of positive feedback on how we have helped people who otherwise wouldn't have been able uh, to get their shot. And we're very proud of the work that we've done there um, with at Lyft, but then of course with all of our with all of our partners. And thank you for sharing that, Megan. And, and I think it comes back, you know, coming back to Dr. Uh, uh, Reverend Bird's beloved communities and partnerships, so important, and really looking at health care holistically, right? All of the different pieces. And we know from our population health gurus that 80% of health outcomes is everything other than what happens with the medical encounter. So I want to turn to, to Marcus. Tell us a little bit about Walmart and Walmart's entry into healthcare and how COVID-19 truly sort of catapulted, was the catalyst for Walmart truly jumping in, you know, you know, all in to help solve and bring access to uh, COVID-19 um, vaccines testing. Tell us a little bit more about what, what happened here, what you've done. Well, uh, first off, uh, I just thank you so much and it's a real honor to be a part of this conversation. Um, I, I think in terms of framing what we've done, I mean, I, I think it's probably important 
to understand what we see as the challenge and 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 the challenge that um, that really all Americans face, but particularly those who are the most underserved. Um, I think the the burden is even greater that you hear these challenges of um, I can't uh, afford the basic care that I need for myself and my family. That the care that I need is not accessible or convenient or delivered in a way that I can that I can access. Um, that that care in America is often intentionally complex, unserving, unsupporting, um, and, and and you put that all together: the the lack of affordability, the lack of accessibility, the complexity, and you, and particularly you think about communities uh, where there is deep inequity. Uh, that is even more; those those issues are even more of a challenge. Um, the result of that, and this is the real problem, is what you hear is everybody saying because of those issues that we are all deferring or delaying or never getting the basic care we need. And the result of that is then things explode on us downstream. And so then we're surprised that we spend so much in healthcare but get so little for the money that we spend. And so I think the challenge that we're trying to address is that. How do you attack those core fundamental challenges of affordability, of accessibility, um, uh, of making things simpler for people, uh, particularly for those communities that have the greatest need. And so, you know, I even go back to when we launched, you know, almost a decade and a half ago, the launch of the $4 generic program. What was interesting about that program was, you know, we had people who were coming in. This was this was not about, you know, that they were getting their, their prescriptions filled elsewhere. These were people who weren't getting their prescriptions filled at all. Or you'd hear stories about they were having to choose between food and, and their medicines, or they were splitting pills between, you know, husbands and wives were splitting pills, and now they didn't have to split pills. I think more recently with the launch of Walmart Health, which are these large integrated centers that have primary care and uh, behavioral health, mental health services, and social health services, and then basic other services like dental and vision and hearing, and, and delivering them at a very clear and open price to everybody in the community, it's, it's for us really been about, it is about attacking those, those sort of challenges. And I think what COVID taught us, um, if, if anything, is that um, we need to go, that, that, these, that we need to go a step further. And I think what it taught us is that um, people are, do want, are seeking out care, are, are trying to find ways to get what they can need for themselves and their families. Um, you, you look at the rise of, of telehealth, for example, Certainly, we saw significant movement in that direction. But you know, I think about I was just in a community in Chicago where uh, thirty percent of the community doesn't have smartphones and doesn't have access to internet. Telehealth doesn't do you any good if you don't actually have the tools and the mechanisms and the communication capabilities to to reach people. So I think it's incumbent on us to say, how do you think about a, a world that that is increasingly omni-channel, which it should be about giving people access to options? And enabling them to figure out from those options how best they can address their their health needs, and so that's that's really what we're focused on. I think COVID it didn't really sort of change the trajectory. I think COVID was uh, really just was a propellant. It said what we learned is we need to move faster. We need to go harder around creating this omni-channel world in which we make care more affordable and more accessible. Perfect. Thank you. And so going back to to Reverend Bird. Speaking about beloved communities, partnership, I want to bring up a quick, we spent a few seconds on trust, because as we move to equitable care, right, and you want to think of our patients and our communities as partners, and this human connection, trust is really important, right, because I always say your health is your most important asset. You have to have that trust. So, so Reverend Bird, tell us a little bit about what we all can do, because this is a partnership um, on the journey to health and wellness. What can we do to really get all, you know, all communities who have been ignored and who are disproportionately affected to really trust us, trust the entire you know, ecosystem? Well, well, first of all, you are a cardiologist, and I'm told a very good one. And so you do heart work, and in my field of endeavor, I do heart work too, in a yes. sense. You can't talk about trust in any community until you ha have first an understanding 
of the context in which others live. And there also must be love at the table. Do I love my neighbor enough mm -hmm. to commit myself to whatever I can do to ensure that my life, expect, my life expectancy does not exceed their life expectancy and we live within a mile from each other? So I would suggest for healthcare groups all over the country, if you are truly interested in building beloved community, you've got to get in the community. And you don't just get in the community wearing your white coats and saying, we're going to do COVID testing, we're going to do diabetes screenings. You need more than that. Get involved in that local school district. Here in Central Harlem, there are 14,000 people over the age of 25 who don't have GEDs or high school diplomas. Get involved in the community. Find out what's going on in the community. And once the community sees your healthcare name involved in the schools in which their children are, involved in bringing more quality food options to those communities, then you will find the trust level going up. But it cannot be white coat testings and studies on already marginalized people and expect those marginalized people to trust you. It's just not going to happen. Well said. I'm going to turn to, to Marcus and then to Megan to comment on, on trust from the Walmart perspective and the Lyft uh, perspective as we partner to improve health and wellness and get to equity. Well, I mean, I think it, it, trust is paramount. And, and I think one of the ways that um, I, I believe that we, we earn it in, in trying to address challenges in the healthcare system is around being very uh, deliberate in our design approach. And what I mean by that is um, I often hear people bandy about this term, we need to be more consumer centered in healthcare. Mm -hmm. And I, I almost laugh at that. Healthcare is a, is about people. It's not it's not about uh, you know. And that so what I think is our need is how do we actually do when we design solutions? How do we actually create solutions that are about putting the person, the individual, the family, and the community as the sole basis for design? Meaning, don't design based on the interests of the health insurer or the providers or the pharmaceutical manufacturers. They're all there to serve. If you design things, if you if you intentionally design things based on the needs of the individual and the family and the community, I believe we will address also the needs of all those other groups. But what too often what I'm seeing is is uh, uh, solutions that aren't actually about the individual that they they don't they aren't about addressing the kind of core needs and that if you want to build trust, um, you've got to show that you're actually committed to, to solving the problems that. That, uh, that 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 the that the individual that the family needs addressed and that it's not you're not trying to figure out the the challenges of, of some some other group or someone else and so I think for us we, we we try to stay true to you know it is it is all about the customer nothing it, nothing else matters and how do you address their needs well said and Megan coming to final words yeah, I, you know, I think for trust, you know, transportation is a social determinant of health, right? And I think we as a country really struggle with how to ensure that we can pay for social determinants of health within our current financing system of healthcare. So we can create, you know, great clinical programs, but if nobody can get to them, if people, you know, are choosing between food and medications, those great clinical programs aren't going to matter at all. So I think we as a country, in order to get um, people to trust in the, in, the, in the healthcare system. We've got to look at transportation, food, housing, all of these things and figure out how we're going to finance them and support people um, in every aspect of their life um, so that we can hopefully prevent illness and at least, and at, or at best, you know, manage that illness. So I think, thank you, great, Great, um, you know, discussion. Uh, we have 20 seconds left. I'm going to do a quick wrong robin. One word or two words from each of you. What do we need to do to continue to get equitable health care? Reverend Bird. Be present. Megan. 
improve our benefit structures. And Marcus. Uh, I think we just, I think it's, we got to, you get, you get one point for talking about it and nine points for doing it. So let's do it. <laughs> awesome. So, so thank you, my esteemed panelists for a great discussion. I think redesigning healthcare partnership, your health is your most important asset. I think we have to do this collectively to truly get to equitable healthcare and to raise health. So thank you very much for this wonderful and illuminating discussion. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you. Thank you. Thrilled to be here.